speaker of the session is Dr. Lahab, and he will be talking on dark energy surveys more than dark energy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy birthday, Paddy. It's actually my second visit to this place. The first one was just before you opened it. So I still remember the sculptures being installed, and I'm pleased to see that they're still there and that Newton and Einstein talk to each other. Uh, we'll come to it in the talk. Uh, so um, I will follow up the previous talk uh, discussing the whole topic of dark energy, including dark energy survey. Um, this is the telescope in Chile where DES is installed, and that I did take that photo the, the morning after an earthquake of 8.3. So just to prove that to prove that this telescope is robust, uh, uh, and and um, with uh, using those techniques, I would like to emphasize that very much one theme of this talk is that we're not just, by actually designing it to do dark energy, it doesn't mean we can do only dark energy. And there's the you know, known unknowns and unknowns, unknowns. And I'll show a few illustrations how this survey gave results which were not expected and more to come. Um, so I'll talk a bit about lambda and history. Here I'll go a bit off the beaten track and, and illustrate that lambda can actually be measured on megaparsec scales, which is not something uh, appreciated, I think. Then more on dark energy survey and uh, more than dark energy, all the way from planet nine to gravitational wave follow-ups. So first, there is actually another anniversary because it's not only that we are celebrating Paddy's birthday, but it's, lambda is 100 years old, exactly. Uh, in fact, uh, if you can see, this is Einstein's paper uh, suggesting a static universe. And if you can read, it's February 1917. So, Paddy, when you were born, Lambda has already been around for 40 years. And we still don't know what it is. Uh, however, Paddy, as, as usual with great originality, uh, has written this paper just now, uh, past year, and uh, I think there's something which I still have to digest, but it's a very brave uh, idea here to actually come up with some ab initio value for lambda based on information theory. And I think, well, something I still, I'm still would like to talk to you at one of the coffee breaks, but about, but I think clearly we do need to think outside the box. And I think that's an illustration of that. Um, uh, I had the pleasure, of course, to talk to Paddy quite a lot in, during his frequent visits to Cambridge when I was still there. Uh, and uh, we managed to write one paper together with two collaborators, uh, Huang and No. And th we talked about the coffee breaks. Why is this third factor of a third in the sachs wolf formula? And uh, there were some heuristic arguments in the literature for that. Uh, but then uh, Paddy and Greg Grigor showed that actually those arguments don't quite hold. And at the end, there's actually, the end of the paper is actually a quote from Zeldovich and Novikov who said, however, the gravitational shift contains the factor one third, it's still unclear how to interpret it, this coefficient classically. So I don't know if Newton and Einstein discuss it here in the court, but we still, actually, this third just comes out of GR. That's the conclusion of that paper. Um, just to, on an occasion like this, one can be perhaps less technical, a bit more philosophical, so to speak. In fact, that table is from a paper I caught or with a philosopher of science, Michael Amasimi. And I just want to say that in the spirit of uh, thinking about Einstein's equation, having the left-hand side, whether lambda is on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, it leaves the possibilities that either there is a new entity, this is the vacuum energy, we heard about yesterday, a number of talks, or it could be that's the left-hand side, or it could be the right-hand side that actually we need to tweak. Uh, if it's lambda, it's just already there, but it could be something more, so more uh, general than that. And just to say, and we comment on that in, in that uh, review, that we've been there before in the sense that, for example, this motion of Uranus led to a new entity. So it was not giving up the model the Newtonian model, but just adding an object, the equivalent of adding maybe dark energy, 
There was, by the way, an alternative theory to that, which is less known. So brackets is the, the theory that didn't work, while Mercury is just the reverse. Okay, it's a new theory rather than hypothesizing a new object. So I think, very, despite this huge observational effort over so many decades now, I think we're stuck with that question. And uh, this would be important to, sorry, this would be very important thing to understand as a challenge for the next, uh, hopefully coming years, not coming decades. Also, another remark here is that, uh, you know, we, we go to talk after talk. This is not the standard cosmology meeting. Uh, here, there's more kind of freedom to think about other ideas, but you go to talks and they'll show you that data considered W minus one. Uh, you know, there's this question, maybe we talk to each other too much. Maybe if people were in two separate places, not talking to each other at all, using the same data, would they get different answer? So we had such an experiment uh, with the Cold War. You know, it's popular again to, to build walls. Yeah, Charlie? So this is a wall, which luckily no longer exists, but it actually created a very interesting exercise in sociology of science that there was a school led by Zeldovich that advocated Hodrak matter top down, and uh, another, the Western one led by Jim Peebles and others, proposing Hodrak matter bottom up. And I think it's really nice that there were two Two schools could work independently. And actually, you know, we think that this is the winning school, but in fact, the only thing we know exists is hot dark matter. No, not, the, not the amount needed to close the, universe, close the universe, but it's there. And CDM maybe exists. We still haven't seen it. So, you know, there's this question, you know, there's a lot of discovery of globalization these days. On that account, I would say maybe there's too much globalization, as much as I'm very much, uh, you know, making my, li my living by participate in big science, big collaborations. And uh, maybe we over-interact. In any case, I think maybe funding should allow more diversity for thinking outside the box. And actually, why, that's why I enjoy very much this visit, because listening, especially talks by the students, postdocs, I could see people just thinking outside that box. And I've allowed myself to put a section in my chapter for, for the book. So comments are welcome on those remarks. I know, I had to be very careful not to mention Trump in the book. And I know that this could be used as a, I know. But I think it's good to take that point of view as well. And I said pros and cons. Um, now, so this is now off the beaten track. So this is this question that we, when we have to explain cosmological constant uh, to undergraduates, you tell them, look, it's something which only operates on large scales. And in, in oh, sorry. And uh, in um, kind of uh, the Newtonian limit, it's a repulsive force. That's what we tell them. And then you tell them, well, we won't feel it in the room. We won't feel the solar system. Uh, we have to do all these big surveys. We have to go to very high redshift in order to see it. It's called cosmological constant. So you know, this is a question. Could it still be seen on small scales? Now, interestingly enough, with this audience, uh, this is quite related to work which comes under the historical name, the timing argument, uh, which goes back for 59. Donald has worked a lot about it. And in fact, Schomach and Donald wrote that paper in 89, same time Schomach and I were students working with Donald. Uh, so I'm back to that in a roundabout way. And the naive question was, what happens if you add lambda to this? Because the traditional analysis, all these papers and others assume no lambda. Uh, I ended up doing it with a master's student, uh, Kenneth Partridge. Then we realized that Binney and Tremaine have it as a problem, actually. In any case, this somewhat surprising result, it makes a big difference. Andromeda and the Milky Way do feel lambda. It, how does it manifest itself? If you don't put lambda, you get a particular mass. You have to assume, by the way, the age of the universe from Planck, etc., And, of course, the separation and infall. If you put lambda, the mass goes up by 13%. So I find it quite, you know, non, kind of non-trivial, non or at least unexpected, let's say. So we've followed that up recently, and um, using simulations. Okay, so think, think of it really. It's not that I'm going to claim that's the way to measure lambda, or but still we don't would be good to have the mass of the system. But I think it's an interesting toy model to understand what's going on. So here we're using 
It's a work with a PhD student of mine, Michael McLeod, and collaborator Hoffman and Lipskin, using 30,000 pairs in a simulation, which is purely lambda CDM. Here is the true mass. We know the true mass of those pairs, and here is the mass as derived by just solving that simple equation without lambda and with lambda, and here it's with a transverse velocity as well. And I like especially comparing that one to that one. You can see lambda, right? You can see that without lambda, the uh, diagonal line lies above the data, and with lambda, it fixes it. So we actually, we do see lambda, okay? Uh, there is force between uh, those objects. It's not just in the toy model of two objects. Uh, but now, how do we go beyond? So one can, especially in this forum, where there's so many people doing excellent analytic work, at some point, just getting too complicated, right? So, and I think we have to think beyond. And we're now in the era not of big data sets, but also big simulations. And we have to develop new tools. So uh, it's not emphasized yet at the meeting, but we are in this era of big data. Uh, this is even a, an exhibition in London called Big Bang Data, and so on. And, um, we have to think uh, in a new way about this. And uh, I know there are various centers now around the world that do big data. I think the, and uh, in, in the UK, the STFC, our research council announced a bid for a center for doctoral training in data intensive science. And we just heard the good news that we actually got that. We won that uh, competition. And we're going to have 27 uh, PhD students, 15 of them funded by the research council over a few, few years, and the first would be starting um, in September. In fact, we're interviewing students today and this of the week, and I'm not there, but colleagues will do the job. And this is very much machine learning is one of the areas to do it with. So, for example, artificial neural networks, some of us used it long time ago to classify objects, to classify galaxies, or telling what a star, what a galaxy, you feed in parameters, and you train and you predict the outcome. There's the qu another method called decision trees. In fact, we use all these methods recently to classify supernovae as well. So what's the connection between that and doing cosmology? So here's the example. We actually said, look, we can't model this entire se setup. And uh, therefore, we'll actually take a simulation and train this neural network based on other parameters and see could we improve the mass estimate, right? And here, the parameter which seems to be the winner is the shear of the velocity field. So it's the mixed derivatives of the velocity. And the bottom lines may be a bit difficult to see without the neural net. If you just do timing argument with lambda, you get the dashed lines. And with it, uh, you can see it gets rid of a lot of scatter. The estimate is about the same, 4.9, 10 to the 12 but it reduces the scatter. So I think you take it as a kind of uh, a toy model or an experiment that I think has a future there on how to really take the complexity of nonlinearity and bring, take it into account. Of course, after you found it, you have to still go back, understand it's not a black box, understand it, and maybe, maybe come up with a new analytic method on how to, this gives you that scatter. So we haven't done it. It's actually something we wish to do. Uh, there is at least one paper that tried, no, not with the machine learning, but just the analytic work using MOND, for example. So this would be an interesting thing to do. OK, dark energy survey. You've heard about it from Tamara. This has dominated my professional life for uh, now 12 years. Uh, so I got into it after finishing 2DF when I was in Cambridge, when I moved to head the group in at UCL in 2004. Um, soon after my move there, where we started the cosmology group, uh, we met, uh, I met by some kind of coincidence in a way, uh, uh, John Peoples, the first director, and George Freeman, the current director, and we talked about this, and uh, it's really started from a very small group of people, now it's nearly 500 or so, and uh, we, you heard about, it's one, probably one of the first services to, uh, to suggest this multi-approach that you heard about, uh, resulting 300 million photometric redshifts and so on, 3,500 supernovae with all this synergy with VISTA, Hemisphere, Hemisphere Survey, South Pole Telescope, OSDES, etc. And uh, all is well, 
Um, I can tell you this is when you just, just think about it and try to get the funding and then see your colleagues in the basement putting it together, putting five lenses together, you never, you know, you don't take it for granted it's going to work. And uh, we're very fortunate actually to have the optical corrector was actually built in our basement. Um, we got some money at the beginning from STFC. And uh, at the end of the day, to reach actually that median seeing of 0.9 seconds, which is what you need for weak lensing, you know, one has to pause for at least for a second and say, wow, it's not simple, right? And it even survived the earthquake. Uh, so that's all happening. Essentially, we are out of five seasons. We have four are done. In fact, the fourth one just completed in, in February. Uh, year three, the weather was not so kind to us. Year four was very good. And it's a long journey. It's a long journey. Just I'm telling you to see young people who wish to get in this adventure. Even with an existing telescope, ground-based, you end up, you know, 12 years I spent, uh, until recently I was the co-chair of the science committee of the project. So seeing it from the beginning to the first, uh, there are now 90 papers or so uh, on the archive. And more to come soon. More to come soon, especially analyzing the data from year one. It takes time from collecting the data to producing catalogs. Uh, this is, by the way, of those 500, we have a subset at UCL. This is funded mainly by the European Research Council grant. And we just had a meeting last week, in fact, brainstorming session, what's next? Uh, I wonder, is the light, is it too bright or is it, is it, is it okay? Better with less light. Maybe with less light, because um, I might have some, uh, see if you can do that. Okay, um, I'm conscious of the time. This is a table showing the kind of inventory of, of what is found up to December 2015 and what eventually after five years. And you've seen some of these numbers in, in the previous talk, uh, but it's kind of nice, you know, it's not just talking, we will measure three million, three million, but you know, there, those hundreds of millions already exist. Um, supernovae, apart from the 1A, uh, there's this super luminous supernova, this type of very energetic uh, objects which, which were found, uh, 17 Milky Way companions. So it's in something which is, again, uh, was kind of expected, but until you actually measure new things, you don't know they're there. And this, of course, has implications by itself to understanding the Milky Way dynamics and dark matter in a different way. Probably by the end of the server might be 25. Quasars at high redshift, of course, stars, don't forget them. Um, and this was completely unexpected, all this work on the solar system, uh, discovering these trans-Neptunian objects. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of them was actually used to forecast the hypothetical planet nine. And by coincidence of nature, if planet nine exists, and if we know its orbit, it's going to cross through the dark energy survey footprint. So there's quite a lot of activity within the dark energy survey to look for planet nine. And I bet that if it's gonna be found, it will be more remembered for planet nine than for dark energy. As we heard yesterday, people <laughs> are more interested in Pluto than in <laughs> Big Bang, right? So, you know, let's hope. This would be absolutely fantastic. No offense if that's how it's gonna be remembered. Uh, so, moving on. Um, you can see it by using these four probes that one can measure mass and one can measure light. So the obvious thing is, of course, the galaxies per type. So this is just like the old traditional catalog. You have it, it could be the main survey or the red objects. That's the easy part, relatively. And you have to do the photometric redshift, which is a whole other story where we also use machine learning and so on. But then one can get Mass from weak lensing, so the dark energy survey galaxies get lensed by intervening matter. You've seen already some results. And it's, I like to call it the 1% rule. It's a distortion of 1%, which you need to know to 1% in order to get W to 1%. Okay, I hope it's clear. <laughs> and at the same time, you also have mass maps that come from the CMB. The CMB photons also get distorted. Of course, here, the kernel of that distortion peaks at the redshift two. Here, it's below one. 
but you can relate them. So we got this triangle, and we're doing all these cross correlations, uh, two point statistics. You've seen an earlier version of that. Um, just to tell you, Donald asked the intriguing question what have we learned from weak lensing? So, at least, you know, this is an illustration that if you assume GR, uh, you get a, a mass map. So the red are the high peaks of that distribution, and the blue are the low, underdense regions. And these circles are actually classes of galaxies designed by richness. Uh, and uh, you can see typical scales here of tens of megaparsecs. And you, know, you can even see correlations by eye. So I think you know, it's, it's just, it's, it, thank you. Uh, it just shows us dark matter is there. Now, you can do more with that. You can start quantifying it. So with a PhD student, Lucy Clerkin, and collaborators, we actually derived the probability distribution function. I feel it's getting a bit boring just to do two-point statistic. Now, weak lenses are very, you know, they're still trying to prove they can get a two-point right, so they tell me, no, no, first let's do two. So we, we're a bit adventurous, and we've done the what's called the projected mass, which is called kappa in the jargon. We actually plotted the whole PDF, okay, the probability for finding that projected mass. And uh, we've done it the same with galaxies. That's not new. This is done many, many, in fact, since Hubble and in many surveys. So it's well established that galaxies to first approximation, the counts in cells is, is log normal. Uh, it's skewed. It's non-Gaussian, but it's not necessarily due to the primordial non-Gaussianity we heard about yesterday. Even if non-Gaussianity at the beginning is zero, gravity itself generates non uh, non uh, um, Gaussianity, and here it's a bit more difficult to see it. Uh, this is, by the way, on, on three different scales, uh, but essentially the data favor an underlying log normal than Gaussian, which is not surprising. So I think we'll see lots of that going on in future years with projects such as Euclid and LSST and so on. To Donald's question, what have we learned from weak lensing? This is an example of that in the Sigma omega m, you heard the definitions earlier. That's the amplitude, and that's omega m. The amplitude fluctuations, that's omega matter. Uh, if we do the two-point functions, we get those um, orange contours there. So it's this banana shape, there's degeneracy. This, I should emphasize, this is just based on 3% of the data, okay? So hope, hopefully very soon, you'll see a much, much better picture of that. Uh, this is if you do a different statistics that you only take the peaks. And interestingly enough, they agree with each other. And here we have, again, some other comparison. This is the cosmic shear, as we call it, the dotted lines. And the light blue is the using clustering and uh, lensing. And this is Planck. Now, this is 3% of our data. So hopefully, we'll get there. Uh, collaboration is working very hard now on, on, the, on exactly doing that now with year one data. Um, just to say we should really not close our eyes to other statistics. I mean, it's all good to do the standard stuff, and that's why funding agencies gave us in total $40 million to do that. That's a product we have to produce. Um, but I think there's some other intriguing things uh, which I don't have time to elaborate on, so I'm just saying it very quickly. But there is the so-called CMB cold spot, uh, which might be the result of a, a super void in front of it, uh, with a PhD student, Krishna Naidu, we speculated maybe there are several voids that can relieve the tension. I'm happy to talk about it later. Uh, so I, well, I would say some people said it's a big problem to the standard model. I think it's not such a big problem. You know, in any map, you, you, there is the coldest spot. And it's just a question, what's the level? But I think there's still the, the question about causality between that cold spot and other cold spots and voids in front of it. So it's a nice crosstalk between you know, the CMB and galaxy distributions, not in just a two-point function. This is also quite a fun exercise. We, the pioneering paper is by Wojtak, and we didn't believe the results, so we repeated it, postdoc Iftar Sadeh, that actually you can look at the difference delta V between the BCG, the brightest galaxy member, and surrounding galaxies, and you'll actually see a dip at about 10 kilometers per second, that's gravitational redshift. That's gravitational redshift. Nick Kaiser wrote a paper which shows another four or five effects, uh, which they all come together and 
kind of cancel each other. It's about 10 grams per second. So it's quite intriguing. We can actually see this on those scales. And I think it's, again, a question talking about modified gravity and so on. Maybe it's a way of doing it. So I just want to illustrate the richness of the, of the data. It's not just doing two-point correlation function. And very quickly, neutrino mass, I think, is, 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 is going to be fun. In 2DF, we got an upper limit of 2EV. The latest numbers in literature are 0.2 EV on the sum M1 plus M2 plus M3. Big challenge to the service. Who is, which server will be the first to claim it credibly? In a, no, in a credible way. Uh, be, and, you know, the, I think f from this we predict with Planck probably 0.1 EV, and you know, from below it's 0.06 EV. There's not much room there. So if you don't detect it, it's also a problem. Um, and uh, I think this is all quite interesting. Of course, there's more to do with dark energy. And uh, I can refer, we, we put together an overview paper, which is on the archive in Mathurances, of everything else you can do with dark energy, which is not dark energy or cosmology. So I refer you to that as supernova, superluminous supernova, equasars, etc. But maybe to this GR oriented forum, I'll just mention, of course, something important happened a year ago. Uh, no need to explain the detection of gravitational waves. And there is an agreement between the um, LIGO collaboration and many other surveys, including Dark Energy Survey, to actually do follow-ups. So do you get an alert? And actually, we got an alert the night I was at the telescope, but then it was an earthquake. And this was actually the true first event. So we didn't observe it at night. Apologies, but we're still alive. Uh, but then there was follow-up. And nothing was found, OK? Now, there are two reasons for it. First, the experts tell us that if it's a black hole, black hole merger, there is no, there are no uh, optical signatures of that. That's what the standard model is. You know, when you talk to people, they say maybe nature is more imaginative. So, uh, so we don't know. But the other problem is, of course, the, the, the direction is very ill-defined, hundreds of square degrees on the sky. But still, it's a good exercise, and more will come from neutron star, neutron star, and so on. And you know, the good thing is, even if you don't find that, you find other transients. So it's kind of fun. The future also looks bright. Again, all these projects, which now move from the dark energy service, $40 million, these are now things like uh, uh, Euclid LSST. That's in the uh, billion dollar but each of them will give billion galaxies, so it's about one dollar per galaxy. If you like that way <laughs> of thinking, that's what you have to, can explain politicians. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, again, many groups around the world are involved in that. We also are about DESI, and so our group is also involved in all these three, and there's a, just like in particle physics, there's a whole uh, roadmap all the way to the 2030s and so on. I think it's great these are things are happening. I think without the dark energy label, we probably wouldn't get there. Uh, but the same thing, we shouldn't, shouldn't lose track and just also look for other things to do with the data. So that's it. I think if we go back to the APM result, 1990, I think we basically have 25 years of this paradigm. So young members of the audience never lived in a different paradigm, that Lambda CDM, which we still don't understand. I think it's important to think about new tests, such as the local group test uh, called spot gravitational redshift, Dark energy survey already does see dark matter, loosely speaking. Dark energy is on the way. I think it's you know, part of a roadmap, APM, 2DF, Sloan, leading to LSST, DESI, Euclid, W first. It's not mentioned maybe strongly enough, but you know, one thing would be to rule out whether the W equation set varies with redshift. It would be good to rule it out. Uh, and then I think we can stop. And the uh, neutrino mass and also, systematics are very important, both astrophysical, instrumental, and so on. That's the only way you can re re reach that a point and relate to the question earlier, this difference between precision and accuracy. You can make a precise measurement, but actually it would be on the wrong value. So we have to do both and make sure we get both. So I'll stop here. Thanks for listening. Which, ah, 
when I say support by most observation? Well, that's why I use most. So, not all. Okay, not all. Okay, so there is the so-called tension, okay? Tension, okay? So that's the way of saying something doesn't quite agree. So what, the, what now, to be fair, those who remember the paradigm shift to lambda, at some point there was tension. There was tension, which then, and then there was like the, you know, the wave function collapsed. Suddenly everyone seemed to agree that it's lambda. So what are the tension? There is tension about sigma 8, especially weak lensing and CMB. There are some differences there. There's a tension about the Hubble constant. So we used to think about, is it 50 or 100 kilometers per second megaparsec, and now it's easy 68 or 73, depending if you use what 68 is from Planck or 73 if you use supernova. So is this a crisis? I don't know. I don't think it's a fundamental number. But uh, if you change it in Planck to 73, you mess up other parameters. So I, I would say, you know, it's probably good to be cautious. And it's a very nice thing to, to give to students, postdoc, to investigate why there is tension in a certain parameter. You can't go wrong. Because either you learn something about astrophysics or the instrument. So I think we have to, to keep an open eye. Of Mond. Yeah. Well, One can check it out in simulation, and people have done that. Of course, most guys have counter arguments to this, so it is still debatable. But it is not as plain that this scale cannot come mm. from standard physics. Okay. Question regarding local dynamics as a discriminator of yeah. lambda. Yeah. What can Gaia data say about this? What can? The data from Gaia is becoming available now. From Gaia? Gaia is uh, like uh, well, almost up to a megaparsec, they will get stellar. I think this is something to, to explore. I mean, to you mean you can actually measure transverse yeah, motions. Yeah, almost up to uh, a megaparsec. Because right? there's still ambiguity, by the way, about the, what, what's the, the transverse velocity. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some recent paper that claimed, I think it's Solomon et al, that claimed a fairly large one. So I think this could be another interesting direction, actually, to, to use that local dynamics. Any no, I am uh, quite intrigued by your weak lensing map again, because Donald brought it up. Because, uh, see, you've done quite a lot of work on mass follows light. I mean, your optical dipole work and all that, one of the early evidence for it. Now, do you think this, this is also a very interesting large-scale weak lensing map? And we have both the clusters as well as the dark matter map. Do you think if there are uh, slight shifts between the peaks of mass and light, we would be able to do, is the accuracy enough? Because it's very intriguing, you know, relation between where you see the rich clusters and where the dark matter, and they, not all, they don't always match. But you know the, the accuracy of the weak lensing yeah. um, data. Would, do you think we'll be able to see it? Yeah, so two brief comments on that. One, one is uh, the problem with weak lensing is that it's, it's a projected mass. It's very di more difficult to localize it. Of course, you can do so-called tomography in some shells, but you cannot do more than three or five shells. So when you do the correlations, it's over, you know, you have the mass over quite a large shell cross-correlated with more accurate position of objects. But then I, I agree with you. If, if I think that's what you're getting at, that one can use that to actually learn in more detail about so-called biasing, which is still actually, I can tell you, now, in all these, you know, when we're trying to put together the, the, the cosmology papers, modeling of the biasing is still un, kind of unresolved. There's no textbook. Well, there are too many textbook. <laughs> there are too many textbook expressions. That shows you there isn't one which is unique. And then it's a function of the type and so on and redshift. 
So I'm happy to talk about it, and it may not even be just deterministic, be stochastic, and so on. There's a literature now which goes, you know, it's like over 30 years of bias thing, and it's still actually an issue now when we're trying to get the sigma 8 and this comparison. But maybe one can turn it around, assume cosmology, and use maps like this, and just to, you know, to whet your appetite, this is only from 3% of the data. Uh, there are already maps which I cannot show of doing it over the whole panoramic view or part of it, and imagine later with Euclid and LSST, you'll have it over half the sky. Having said that, the community is divided between those who love maps, and I know you're one of them, and those who say, why do we need maps? What we want is RMS, and I completely, you know, I, I like maps. I think it was Donald's influence. <laughs> yeah. Any further questions? Yeah. If there are no more questions. Ah. Is, uh, Donald has one. Place where it's darkest, you can't see the fact that there are a whole lot of galaxies there because it's so dark that you can't see them. Right. So, so it would be better if you changed the scale of the brown so that it was a bit lighter where it's darkest. Right. <laughs> yeah. So let us thank the speaker again. Right. So our next speaker is Asim, one of the organizers. He'll be talking on gender relativistic screening in cosmological simulations. And using the non-maxation. <laughs> Return of the... <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Okay.